All right, here we go. Prophecy, end time stuff, what the second coming is going to look like. We're going to talk about uh, the cosmic signs that Jesus discusses, where he talks about the sun getting dark, the moon, the, the stars falling. Like, how literal is that? Or is it like really symbolic? It represents totally different things. We'll talk about that. Um, what are the theological implications in the second coming of Christ? I know that's not a question people ask, but they should. It's very exciting. And we're going to talk about that today. What is the gathering of the elect? And does this passage, okay, look, hear me out. Does this passage support a post-tribulational rapture view? I'm not even saying that's my view. I don't know my view, right? But I want to unpack the issues and let you guys understand them, let you think through these things. And so we'll, we'll discuss it and I'll share some different perspectives. And then, of course, what's the main lesson for us to have on the coming of Christ? And that's really where the heart of this comes down. But here we are. We're in the Mark series, part 54. We're dealing with Mark 13, verses 24 through 27. Let me just read this passage to you because I want you to understand, like, we, we want to really get what Jesus is saying. Not just to, to use it for, like, a preaching point, but to, like, thoroughly understand the words of Christ where he says, in those days... After the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. What is that about? The fig tree stuff, we're going to deal with that. That's the next verse here. We'll deal with that next week uh, in detail, the fig tree stuff and a bunch of other things the next, um, not next week, but two weeks. I'll explain later. At any rate, what is going on here? Um, okay, to catch you guys up, if you've not been following in the Mark series, if you haven't caught the last several studies that I've done in this series, let me give you a super fast recap. There are a bunch of things Jesus talks about in Mark 13, this one section in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus predicts the future. Right, He gives his prophecy about the end times. And he mentions things that are not signs, earthquakes and wars and things like that. These are not signs, even though everybody obsesses over them as though they are signs. I think we've, make a, we've made a big mistake in doing that. Then he gives one thing that is a sign. I went over this last time. The abomination of desolation. This was two weeks ago, actually, uh, chronologically, where I went over the abomination of desolation. What is it? What might it be? All that kind of thing. Then there's going to be this time of tribulation. This, and, and I would say it's a three and a half year period. I'll get... I talked about this last time, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it today. Then after that tribulation, after that three and a half year period, there's all these things that go down, right? Signs in the sky, the sun darkened, the moon not giving its light. Then Jesus is going to be seen coming in the clouds and he's going to gather his elect together with him. What is all of this about? What does it mean? What are some different views? I can actually tell you guys happily that when it comes to this particular section of scripture, there's actually more agreement here than there is in the stuff we've covered in the past few weeks. The abomination of desolation, there's more disagreement on that. Um, although I think I unpacked, a, I think, a solid case for my view on the passage. But here, even those who are preterists, a, a term I'm willing to use now because I've given you guys my six views on Christian eschatology stuff. <laughs> um, the people who are preterists, as it as pertains to the, the Gospels, as it pertains to what Jesus says in this passage, the Olivet Discourse. Those people who think that stuff happened in 70 AD, even many of them would see the section I just read to you as future, as still future. So here we have like a lot of people, all futurists see it as future. Even many preterists see this as future. That's, that's pretty typical. Not all of them. Certainly not all of them. I think that uh, um, Apologia Studios, Jeff Durbin, I, th I think he would be one who sees this as past. That this coming is a past event. Um, I, I could be wrong here. Um, but that's, that's, that's Jeff's fault. Cause I've listened to Jeff's, a couple of his sermons and his like an hour and 20 minutes and you still aren't entirely sure what his view is. <laughs> and so <laughs> take that Jeff Durbin at any rate, the, um, I say that as a brother. All right. It's a brother. Yeah. You, you need to be able to summarize your views at some point, even if your video is really long, like mine are. So here we go. Verse 24. Let's look at this passage. Um, in those days after that tribulation, the first question we should ask, right? I always ask questions when you approach the text of scripture is what's those, uh, the tribulation? What is that tribulation? What are the, the days of that tribulation that he's talking about? And we went over this last week, but basically we're bringing together several passages of scripture. Daniel 9, 27, 11, 31, Daniel 12, 11, Revelation 13, 5. And we're saying, look, these are all talking about the same thing. It's a three and a half year period of great 
suffering tribulation of God's judgment on the planet. And it's sort of inaugurated or you, you're fully aware it's happening when the abomination of desolation takes place. Then there's three and a half years. That means then that what, what Jesus describes next, the, the second coming is happening right at the end of that three and a half year period. It happens in close proximity to the abomination of desolation event. Now, some people will say that that tribulation where the Bible talks about the 42 months in Revelation, three and a half years, that, that that's actually, um, it, it's, it's a symbolic term, 42 months, and it represents, this is not my view, guys, but some people will say it represents all of the stuff that's gone on since basically, you know, after Christ's ascension until now, and all the tribulation, which is a very strange view that 42 months is stretched out to represent such a massive period of time. Um, anyway. I don't think that that view works um, at all. So we'll move on. Um, the, the thing here Jesus says is after that tribulation, and you might say, well, maybe like some people, preterists would, some some of them, not all, would say that the view, the, the tribulation time is like 66 to 70 AD. And it's, and it's uh, particularly, it's earlier, even before 70 AD, it's these 42 months when Nero was hotly persecuting the church. He was bringing a lot of pain and suffering into the church. He And he was, historically, there was about three and a half years of great suffering that Nero brought upon the church until he was killed, uh, killed himself ultimately, because uh, he was just going to get killed in worse ways if he didn't. And they would say that that's what that is. Now, here's where I'm going to push back on that view, because I think that what Jesus is saying here is that whatever you think the tribulation is in Mark 13, He's saying that his coming is going to happen three and a half years later. So you're kind of, you, you kind of need to see, let me build my case for this. All right. And we're going to follow with the phrase in those days. You'll notice in verse 24, this is probably the harder part of today's study. I, I imagine as I try to imagine how easy it will be to digest everything I'm saying, but track with the phrase in those days, in those days after that tribulation. Okay. Now we're going to back up and we're going to look at this verses in context. And we're just going to notice how often Jesus refers to the those days as being that immediate period, immediately after the abomination of desolation, right? Where this like antichrist figure presents himself as God in the temple, demands worship, that there's this three and a half year period, that that's when Jesus comes back is right at the end of that three and a half year period. Here's a case for that, aside from verses I already shared. In verse 14, Jesus says, um, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Did you notice the those days here? Those days. Um, oops, I grabbed the wrong those. Those days. Jesus specifically is warning people about those days. He, this is a term that he uses to refer to the tribulation that immediately follows the abomination of desolation. Like historically, it ha happens right then. But pray that it may not happen in winter for those days will be a time of tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will. This is definitely... Those days, time of tribulation. Jesus is talking about this same time period. The second coming happens at the, at the close of that limited tribulation time. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or behold, he is there. Don't believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will, sh and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed. Behold, I've told you everything in advance. And just a quick reminder, since we happen to read through this section, every like 10 minutes, there's like a new false Christ in the world and raising up and starting their own religious group and claiming that they're the second coming. And we know they're all wrong. I don't even have to look at their theology. I don't have to, I don't care if they've done some sort of supernatural thing to try to confirm who they are. Jesus himself said, ignore them all because when I come, everyone will see it. No one's going to have to tell you about it. And this would save so many people from joining cults if they would just heed the words of Jesus about his coming. Verse 24, finally, in that context, in those days after that tribulation. So Jesus' coming that he talks about here in Mark 13, it happens immediately on the heels of the tribulation. We can make this even stronger uh, with 2 Thessalonians 2.8. 
it says, then the lawless one will be revealed. That that's We're talking about the abomination of desolation guy, the antichrist, the lawless one, the man of sin. The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So not only is there like an abomination of desolation that reveals this man of sin, but he continues to persecute for three and a half years, scripture says. And then Jesus returns and his return is what puts a stop to the guy. So yeah, you've got actually like a time clock here in scripture. There's like approximately three and a half years from the abomination of desolation until the return of Christ. That's what we're looking at here. Um, I would correct or try to correct people who want to use earthquakes and and maybe there is that a one world government or maybe the temple's being built. And I would say don't use these things to determine the time of the end. The one thing Jesus gave, however, is the abomination of desolation. All right, now let's go to the next question we have, which is going to be about the um, the sun getting dark. What is up with that? Is that literal or symbolic? Now, let me. I'll give you three options. I'll, I'll tell you the way the atheist tends to take this verse, or the skeptic or the non-believer. I'll tell you how uh, some scholars take this verse, and then I'll tell you how um, I take this verse, which is going to be. Um, although there are some scholars that agree with me too. I'm not on my own here, but I'm going to share with you a view that you probably have never heard before. Most of you. And you should at least be aware of it. It's a thoughtful view. I think it's just wrong. <laughs> so here we are, Mark 13, 24. And Jesus says, in those days after that tribulation, then he describes these events. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven. And the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. The question we have is, how do we take these things? There are three ways to take it. Like, I'll give you the skeptic way to take it. And this is how I always hear uh, skeptics online take it. They take it in the super hyper literal fashion that the sun is going to be darkened like millions of miles away. The sun will be put out. That's how they take it. And then stars are going to actually fall like Betelgeuse. The star is going to fall and hit the earth, even though it's far larger than the earth. And that doesn't work. <laughs> like we're all dead if any of the stars come and hit us. And so then they would mock Jesus or mock Christians because we have this backward, you know, Bronze Age goat herders wrote our book. They always use the phrase Bronze Age, Bronze Age goat herders. They tell you know they're all reading from the same uh, talking point list. But but my, my response to this would be, you guys, like, you're the only ones that take it that way. Okay? Like, it's just it's just skeptics that take it that way because you, you've found a way to take it that, that allows mockery of what's there. So there is also a symbolic view and the symbolic view which is what many scholars would actually support is the idea that these things the stars being darkened the sun being darkened well they represent a few things political powers being put out and they're going to build a case for it okay you can try to build a case for it i'll explain it to you in a minute here they represent political powers being put out they represent demonic forces or pagan worship so this could be like say those who are into astrology and the idea is that your your um your false religions, when you look to your leaders, to your imam or whoever, they're not going to be able to help you during this tribulation time. They're going to have no no source of knowledge or information for you. You look to astrology, it's going to give you nothing. All of these um, false areas of worship are going to fail you. And so stars represent, of course, symbolically the worship of these false things. And it could also be the power of Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. Paul talks about... Um, principalities and powers in heavenly places and so this could be a reference to the spiritual shutting down of the power of satan okay so there there be a symbolic view that's there and i'll give you other scriptures that people use to support that perspective in a second finally there's my view uh, which is that this, and this is probably a more common view most of us probably hold this view it's flexibly literal it is literal jesus really means you know the sun will go dark and the moon not give its light and the stars will fall, but it's flexibly literal, meaning stars are probably here talking about meteors. This this shouldn't be shocking to anybody. This it seems to me should be the first thing you think of when you read the passage. Let me explain. Um, nowadays, just as back in the day, we we use the phrase shooting stars. Like if you see a shooting star, you've even told your friend, like, wow, I, shot, I saw a shooting star today. Now, if your friend decides to treat you in the hyper-literal skeptical standpoint, they might look at you and mock you. You think a star that's far larger than the earth crashed into the earth and you saw it? <laughs> you wouldn't even be alive to witness such an event. Um, and you would look at them and be like, are you being purposefully obtuse? You know, <laughs> No, of course we don't mean that. The sun getting dark, it wouldn't be the sun like millions of miles away like 
disappearing or losing its ability to shine light. This would probably just be ref referring to from the perspective of people on Earth, the sun gets dark. Now, I live in California where we've had a lot of serious fires recently. And where I live, we're close enough to some of those fires that we've had days where the sun was dark. I mean, it wasn't like black dark. Um, if I had lived closer to the fires, I might have been at, been you know, experiencing even more darkness during the daylight. But there's times where the, where the whole sky just looks orange and gloomy. And it's weird. And this would be something like that. You could say, okay, so there could be atmospheric events happening, uh, obstructing sunlight. That is not far-fetched. And it would be a way in which God is revealing his judgment. So, the, I mean, in other words, that's the, the flexibly literal view. This is probably a more common Christian perspective on it. It's dark from the Earth's perspective. Or they're shooting stars. Well, I mean, they called everything stars back then. Um, they didn't call them planets. They called them wandering stars, right? Because they, they didn't follow the same pattern going around the, the, the world that other stars followed. The planets would, would, would go different directions, wandering stars. They do their own thing. Uh, but it is, everything is called a star back then. So it's not that big of a deal. All right. Let's talk about the symbolic view because um, this is a view that I think most of us are not familiar with. And it also sounds really silly the first time you hear it to most of us. But I think if I can help you understand the case for it. So here's what I'm going to do. Join me on a journey while I build a case for the symbolic view and then try to refute it. <laughs> because I think that this is good for our own Bible studying, our ability to study the scripture. It's healthy when we hear other Christian perspectives on something and understand where they're coming from. Uh, that's often what we don't see in commentaries or especially in teaching. You don't hear different views. You just hear one view. And as far as you know, that that is the only view. And th this is going to give you some different perspectives, especially on eschatology. I consider eschatology an area where we have to have lots of grace to each other. If we don't agree, we need to not be divisive on those issues. We need to not mock and ridicule. We just need to agree to disagree and love, love one another in the midst of it all. These are These are secondary topics. So... What's the symbolic view of the of the darkness? Um, first off, you you can you can build the case this way. Step one, uh, darkness is often used metaphorically in the Old Testament, right? And the Old Testament presents sort of an example of how God often communicates prophetically to to His people. So in Micah three six, we read about the sun going down on the prophets, but in Micah three six, this is not about a special sun event happen. It's really just about they lose knowledge because sun represents light. Right in a in a in a culture with no electricity, when the sun comes up now, you can see the land. When the sun's down, you can't see the land anymore. And so, when the sun goes down on the prophets, it means the prophets will not have vision, will not have direction. They won't they won't have words from the Lord. In Deuteronomy twenty eight twenty nine, it says, uh, "You will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness." And this seems clearly in the context to be symbolic. He says, "You'll grope at noon." He he's talking about you know just general sort of confusion and not knowing what's going on with their culture or with their people because God's judging them because of their sin. Uh, David in, I'll, I'll bring the scripture up for you, 2 Samuel 22, 8. He's giving a description here of God delivering him from Saul and his enemies. I mean, we know this because it says it right here. I'll skip to verse one. David spoke the words of this song to the Lord in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So this is a commemoration of God's regular deliverance in David's life. Okay. But look what he says in verse 8 of 2 Samuel 22. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of heaven were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Well, this is very symbolic here. Uh, I don't think that we have any, we have lots of accounts of David and his deliverances. We don't have the earth quaking and the foundations of heaven trembling, not in a physical sense. But this is symbolically what happened because it's the idea that God, God stood up on his behalf and took action. And so there's sort of the, the trembling, and sh like you think of Jurassic Park, like when a T-Rex is coming, you know, it's the shaking of the ground. And this is symbolically what's happening. You know it's symbolic because you read verse 9, smoke went out of his nostrils, fire from, from his mouth devoured, coals were kindled by it. it this is very poetic sim symbolism using darkness and, and shaking and trembling and fire all as representing God's judgment. So that's true. Like in the Old Testament, we do have this, um, but they can, that's not a strong enough case. Like you, you haven't got me convinced that when Jesus says the sun will get dark, it doesn't look the same as when David describes this in a very poetic passage. So we need something stronger. 
And this is where we have the strongest and weakest part of the symbolic darkness view. It's strong because they can quote a litany of Old Testament passages. It's a little weak because when you look at those passages in detail, they don't do what you think they're going to do, at least not all of the time. So they'll give you a list of passages. And this is what I find. Like in uh, R.T. Francis commentary, he says, let me try to build you this view. And he just lists a bunch of passages. And then he says, basically, here's a bunch of passages. This is where darkness is used symbolically in prophecy. Therefore, when Jesus uses it, it's symbolic. Here's some of the passages. Ezekiel 32.7, Joel 2.10, Joel 2.31, Joel 3.15, Amos 8.9, Isaiah 13.10, um, Isaiah 34 verse 4. And he gives you this, this big list of passages. So what I did was I went through and just looked at each passage in context, asking the question, is it actually symbolic here? Because you can't just quote the, you can't just reference a passage and say, I'm right. Like, is it actually symbolic darkness? And does it look like what Jesus was saying? And, um, it's a mixed bag. So I'm going to quickly run through some of them. Um, let's see, uh, Ezekiel 32, seven, that does seem like it's symbolic. Um, but let me look at the Joel 2.10 one because Joel is always used by all these guys and it is listed as, this is symbolic, right? Um, here is Joel 2.10, it says, Before them, the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. Now, when you look at this passage in context, you go, okay, so there's like somebody's coming to judge or, or, or hurt the Israelites, right? Joel's giving a prophecy of, of punishment that's coming their way. And the sun and moon grow dark, but we don't really have this corresponding eclipse coming or something like that. But when you look at this passage in context, you see in Joel 2, and you could read it on your own, it's about a swarm of locusts that are coming upon the people of Israel. It's very clear. This is about a, a huge swarm of locusts and the locusts are coming and they're going to eat all the crops and everything. And you could go look up videos of locusts online and you could see that if there's enough locusts in the air, the earth feels like it's quaking because there's all the flapping and the noise of their wings. The, the sun and moon do grow dark. The stars lose their brightness because there's just physical obstructions in the sky directly over your head. So Job, Joel 2... 10 is used as an example of symbolic terminology, but it seems more literal, flexibly literal, I would add, <laughs> which is my view <laughs> as I pat myself on the back. Um, then you have other passages, Joel 2.31. Joel 2.31 seems to be talking about a future thing. Um, and it says the sun will be darkened, be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Here I'll summarize this passage to try to say Jesus is being symbolic because Joel is being symbolic. It's very debatable. Um, if you're a futurist, you probably think Joel 2.31 is still about the future. So you can't just say we know it's symbolic. It, it's very debatable. If if you're a preterist, you think it's symbolic. If you're a futurist, you think it could be symbolic or literal. It could be either one. It's not yet fulfilled. It is quoted in Acts by, um, by uh, Peter in Acts chapter 2, but shortcut because the video will be too long if I give you everything. Um, I don't know that we know that, I don't think, honestly, that Peter was saying this part of it has already been fulfilled. I think Peter was giving them a warning that if they do not accept, receive the gospel of Christ, there is going to be future judgment, I think is the point that's going on there, which means it's debatable. Joel 3.15 is like this as well. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars lose their brightness. The, the problem here is you're either going to, you're going to bring your presuppositions into Joel 3.15. If if you have, basically, if you think Joel 2.31, if you have a preterist view of it, then you're going to say it's symbolic, and you're going to say Joel 3.15 is symbolic, and if you have a futurist view, you're going, to, you're going to not be bound by that. So your assumptions will determine your interpretation here. So it shouldn't be used in a case for Jesus being symbolic, in my opinion. In Amos 8.9... We have a whole different prophecy. It says, It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Um, Amos 8, 9, I'm going to give give the symbolic people a bone here. This does look symbolic. The sun going down at noon, as you read through this passage in context, it does look like this is the idea of um, them losing power or being destroyed at the height of their power. So there's the, at noon, when sun's at its full light you're at the height of your power that's when you'll you'll experience destruction this does look symbolic as you read the overall passage um even even wolverd uh who's very much a futurist 
he says this is already fulfilled in the captivities of Israel. So even futurists tend to think this has been already fulfilled. R.T. France says it's about the fate of Israel and its past tense as well. Um, so it could very well be symbolic. The, the surrounding terminologies, if you read the whole chapter, is very symbolic. Amos chapter 8, it, it's, um, it deals with the baldness on every head and a famine of the word of the Lord. Okay, that's a symbolic famine. The baldness on heads is, doesn't have to be literal. It could just be about the suffering that they're going through. Uh, and the embarrassment and shame of it all. And um, yeah, the next one. So there's one. Yep. there. You have to say this. If you want to have a symbolic view of darkness in the future at the second coming of Christ, Amos 8, 9 does support the idea that this could be the case. But there are other passages that go the other way, right? Joel seems to be literal. And Joel seems to also then be connected to a future prophecy from Peter, in my opinion. So it's a mixed bag. Isaiah 13.10 is one other verse I'll, I'll share with you um, that's also symbolic. And it says, For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light, or it may be symbolic. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Um, so the symbolic case is, hey, this was about the Medes taking Babylon, and it seems like it's already been fulfilled in the 6th century. And I'm inclined to think there is a connection to the 6th century here. But if you have a, um, a view of like partial total fulfillment, it may also have a more literal darkness fulfillment in the future as well. So that's also possible, but definitely if it's going to apply to the Medes, then this was a symbolic event. So the sun is dark, the constellations aren't giving their light, the heavens trembling, all that kind of thing um, could be representative of exactly that. It's the destruction of nations, it's the failure of their prophets, it's the, the fact that the stars they would look to religiously don't help them, the moon they would pray to, or the sun they would worship doesn't help them as judgment comes upon them. Okay, that's quite possible. So it seems like it's, it's and, and also I'll add, uh, Isaiah 13.10 is the closest to the words of Jesus in Mark 13.24. Okay, so I could go on. There's some more verses I could cover here, but I think I've, I've covered enough to say this, to conclude this. Um, it could be symbolic. Like Jesus might be symbolic here. It might be literal, or it might actually be both in this in the sense that it's it's a literal physical thing, but then there's a lot of heavy symbolism in it. And that would be my perspective. Let me then build a case for why I think while it could be symbolic, while that's not a foolish view, I think it's probably still literal. Here is a survey of scriptures. Why when the second coming arrives, we're probably going to see the earth will probably, the people here will probably see literal darkness. <clears throat> it says here in, at the crucifixion of Jesus, this is in Mark. So we're back in the context of Mark. We're very close to the context of Mark 13 here. It says that there was a darkness that fell over the whole land until about the ninth hour. So this is about three hours of darkness that falls over the land. This is clearly literal, right? I, I'm going to say this is very obviously literal. There's nothing about it that hints that it wouldn't be entirely honest. Like there's a local, at least over the land, a local eclipse or darkness that falls over the land. Um, <clears throat> I guess it could theoretically be clouds. But the idea is that it was just this, this very thick darkness that was on the land. Now, why do I bring this up? Um, a couple things. One, it establishes that literal darkness is at least possible in the view of the author of Mark, in the experience of the disciples and those who witnessed these things happening. But it also gives you context close to Mark 13. And in addition to this, it gives kind of a precedence, like a prophetic symmetry. Because here you have Jesus talking about his second coming, and he mentions darkness. And here we see at the climax of his first coming, the crucifixion, we see physical darkness. So if there's real physical darkness at his first coming, and he's talked about darkness, that's at least a reason to think that darkness may be literal and physical. The world will actually see it. Then we have 1 Peter. 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 10, let me read it to you and then share why I think this helps build a case, a cumulative case for the idea that this darkness in the future is literal. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in, in which the heavens will pass away and the roar with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Um, I'm just going to say clearly, Peter means literally. Okay, there are some who would argue that this is symbolic. I think that that is irrational for reasons I'll share in a second. Um, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? 
looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Don't you get it? The idea is that for Peter's whole point to make sense, it has to be literal. He's like, all this stuff that we're losing as we serve Christ, as, as he's writing, he's like encouraging them in persecution and suffering. It doesn't matter what you lose because all this is going to burn, guys. And you're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. For that encouragement to make sense, it has to be literal, not just symbolic, I think, for his encouragement to, to make sense. Now, what, what I'm saying here is that in eschatology, in our future, we have a literal new heaven, a literal new earth, and massive cosmic changes that are physical and real. It would seem artificial to say that the cosmic changes at the second coming are then symbolic, right? We had them real at the first coming, real in the distant future at the new creation, and it would seem real at the second coming as well. It just seems consistent with New Testament prophecy. The book of Revelation in a number of places, I won't go through them all, but it mentions the sun becoming dark, so the sun scorching people with heat, a third of the day being darkened, a third of the night. It does it a lot of times, and it seems like it's physical, at least some of those times, even if you were really flexible and thought maybe that one's symbolic. But as you keep reading, when it keeps happening, um, why is it continue to use the same symbol in slightly different fashions with no hint that it's symbolic at that point? I, I think that's something we should think about. Also, let me mention this. The nature of Jesus's victory and lordship is interesting here because his victory and lordship is cosmic. It's not just about people. It's about creation. And so it's just fitting that there are cosmic signs of his coming lordship when he comes and returns as lord of all. Cosmic signs are fitting because he is lord of all. It's not just over man's political governments, but over all creation. So that also makes sense. Another reason I would say we should take these as literal. A literal darkness can embrace the symbolism even better than purely symbolic darkness. If the sun and moon and stars represent, you know, false gods, pagan beliefs, and human powers in resistance to God and satanic forces, if they re represent these things, then God literally darkening them at the coming of Christ or right before the coming is, is a very strong way to push the symbolism of what he's judging, the rebellion against God in the world. That's a strong way to push that, right? But if, if they're, if the darkness doesn't even happen, it, you know, it just seems like it's not as powerful, <laughs> Um, also, and here probably is the strongest reason I would give, and you might think, boy, Mike, you're really dragging this out. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a Bible nerd and, uh, I'm going to make you one too, if, whether you like it or not. Luke 21 verses 25 and 26, Jesus not only talks about the darkening here, it's a parallel passage to Mark, but he tells us it's a sign. Now, let me, let me read it to you. Just, just recognize this. It's a sign. And that sign causes people on the earth to know something, to fear something, to feel something. And if it's symbolic, it doesn't work as a sign. I'll explain why in a second. Let me read the passage. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars. That's signs in sun and moon and stars. And on the earth, dismay among nations. Now, if if the sun and moon and stars represent the nation's powers, why are there signs in the sun and the nations? It, does, it seems artificial now that they're being separated from each other. In perplexity, at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world for the, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is the same passage. Oh, I didn't put it on your screen. This is the same uh, teaching Jesus is recording in Luke that we have in Mark. The next thing he says is, then they'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. So it's got to be, I think, to be honest, I think it's got to be physical signs in the sun and moon and stars or else people aren't going to see it in fear. If you say that the signs are the failure of religion, well, that's happened many times in, in the years. If you say the signs are the, are political upheaval and destruction of nations, and that's what the darkness represents is nations being destroyed. Well, then like, how is World War One not the sign? How is World War Two not the sign? Do you understand? Like, if the signs aren't actual physical signs in creation outside of, you know, the, uh, the, the political and religious things going on in the world, then it seems like we will never know they're fulfilled because they could have been fulfilled countless times in history. So there's my case. My conclusion is um, that I think that these are physical signs, that the darkening of the sun and moon and the stars falling, which would be meteors, um, that these things are, are literal with heavy symbolic meaning, literal events with heavy symbolic meaning. 
All right, let's then go to verse 26. What is this going to look like? That's the next question we're asking. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Some people, believe it or not, some people teach that this event already happened in 70 AD. I'm surprised by this. I think a lot of people are. Um, I... Now, there are some people who teach this and they still teach that Revelation talks about a future coming of Christ. So this person will say, oh yes, Revelation 20, 21, that's a future, but I'm a preterist about Mark 13. I'm a preterist about the all of it discourse. And that, that would be this person who kind of separates those views. They're still my brother and sister in Christ. I think that that's a mistake. I think that this is probably one of the weakest spots in the whole preterist construction of Mark 13, um, because Jesus describes people seeing him coming in the clouds, right? They'd obviously have to take the other stuff pretty loosely as far as its fulfillment having happened supposedly in 70 AD. But there are some who even say this, verse 27 is that the coming of the sun with power and great glory is actually already happened. Um, one of the ways they say this, I mentioned before, is that Josephus has in in, Josephus is a first century historian. He records the events of 70 AD. He's like our go-to source to know what happened back then. And in one of his spots where he's talking about this, he mentions that there were people who were watchers, who were watching for when the Romans were launching the, you know, their war machines. They're launching rocks, huge boulders and rocks at Jerusalem. And they would cry out, the stone is coming. The stone is coming. This is what they would cry out so that the people would know to flee the area because a stone is going to potentially kill them. And there's one like what seems to be a typo in one manuscript of Josephus where it says the sun is coming. Now I've heard some preterists say Josephus says, and they, and they don't admit, admit that this is like a weird variant in the manuscripts. Like this isn't really probably what happened, but who say, well, when, when, uh, when the temple was being destroyed and they were throwing the stones, these white stones kind of represents the sun, the rock, right? Of Daniel, when the rock comes in and all these connections that are loose, but you could kind of do that if you want. And then they go, and they would cry out, the, the sun is coming, the sun is coming. And these some preterists are, to be honest, are reckless with information here. This is like the the most of a, it's just a huge stretch to say that the second coming, or at least a coming of Christ that Jesus talks about here, saying they will see him coming in the clouds, refers to numerous stones being thrown at Jerusalem and people in a typo <laughs> calling out, the sun is coming. Not all preterists say this, definitely not all preterists say this, and I hope less will say it after I make fun of it. Um, now, others will say, okay, I'm not going to hang it on that. I'm going to hang it on something else. And this is, I believe, say, Jeff Durbin's view, uh, my brother in Christ, who I think is wrong on this issue, but his view would be that, as I understand it, that um, in Mark 13, 27, this already happened. Jesus already came, um, verse uh, 26, sorry, in the clouds, because the phrase coming in the clouds doesn't refer to him showing up on the earth visibly. It refers to a vague sense of God coming in judgment. And there are Old Testament pa passages that mention God coming in judgment. Um, he would say that this is different. The coming in the clouds was 70 AD and in the future, Jesus is going to come back to the earth. And when he comes back to the earth, that's when he'll be visibly seen. The problem with this is the, is the text itself. It says they will see the son of man coming in, in clouds with power and great glory. And he's, he's coming, the great power and glory in his kingdom is the idea. And then the next thing that happens is we're gathered together with him from the four winds. And we'll talk about how some people try to, I think, spin that passage uh, today as well. But first, let's look at this. What is the coming going to look like? Are the clouds, is, is saying he's coming in the clouds, does that mean you can have kind of like a return of Jesus in 70 AD that nobody noticed? And I think that that doesn't work because of Acts chapter 1, where Jesus actually uh, does something pretty cool. And then we're told exactly what the second coming is going to physically look like and how it relates to clouds. It Clouds doesn't mean you don't see it. Clouds is the visible second coming of Christ. And there's lots of scriptures that confirm this. Acts 1 verse 6. So when they'd come together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, slight recap, Jesus, uh, at this point in Acts, Jesus has died. He has risen for 40 days. He has been with the disciples and doing various things. And now he's ascending to heaven. 
And right there, they're at the Mount of Olives. He's about to ascend. And they're like, hey, are you going to restore the kingdom? He tells them, it's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Again, every time that they ask him about the end times, he puts them on a mission to share the gospel. This is a good reminder for us. If you're obsessed with end times, like I have to be forced to deal with end times because I'm doing a verse by verse study and it makes me come across these passages <laughs> and that's healthy. Verse by verse study forces pastors to teach on things they would otherwise neglect. And so I think it's healthy. We, we have to cover everything this, this book is teaching on, everything this Bible says because we're going verse by verse. That's a healthy thing, a restriction on me to keep me from just having hobby horses. But some people who are obsessed with end times need to be reminded that every time the disciples asked about it, he would put them on a mission to go evangelize the world, to, to just buckle down and be ready for persecution and to um, not compromise their lives with sin. And this was the major focus. When it came to end times, he was more about us being on our mission than us focusing on his coming, actually. Um, hoping in it, but not but, but focusing on our mission more than anything else. Anyway, he says, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. Um, and then in verse nine, after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. Physically, Jesus ascended into the sky, right? He, they saw him do it. This was a visible way of God saying, he is victorious. He is worthy. He is the worthy one. And he, he, he doesn't die. He never dies again. He just goes and he's waiting. So a cloud... A cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And now they give him a clue, a key to understanding the second coming. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He's going to return in the same way, which means we have a physical return that's visible, right? That, that he comes sort of through a cloud or with the cloud in that sense. It's literal and physical. Jesus coming in clouds um, is going to be a real thing and he's going to return the same way. And when you, when you hear he comes in the clouds, it doesn't seem right to suggest he, it means he won't touch down. He comes, but doesn't touch down. And this might be a challenge to some pre-trib rapture points. And that's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence on the issue, to be honest. Um, but I don't think it makes sense to say he's going to come and he's in the clouds and then he doesn't touch down and years later he touches down. It, that's, not the, that's not the example we're given in Acts, right? He goes up in the cloud, he comes back and touches down right there on the Mount of Olives, actually. Now, there's other texts that talk about this as well. Um, the Speaking of the sign of the Son of Man... Help us fill in our understanding of what it will look like when Jesus returns. So we have a physical Jesus coming in an actual cloud. Matthew 24, 30, it says then, and this is a parallel passage, same teaching from Jesus. Then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky. What is the sign? The sign. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Again, it's highly visible. All the tribes are seeing it. Everyone is aware of it. This has been, this is the big focus in Jesus talking about a second coming is like, you're all going to know, like, you're all going to see me. I'll be right there. It'll be totally visible to everyone. So 70, 80 does not, it just doesn't work. We should leave it be. Um, so what is the sign is the next question. Like, what is the sign and what's the difference between the, seeing the sign or seeing Jesus? Like, am I going to see the sign of Jesus coming or am I going to see Jesus coming? Because as you read this, right, they, the sign appears and then it says, and they will see the son of man. Is the sign so similar to Jesus? The sign so represents Jesus that seeing it as, is, is, is as if I saw him. Do we see the sign or do we see both? Um, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but there are some different thoughts about this. If we try to unpack it a bit, like what does it look like when Jesus comes back? If everyone sees him, we have a physical Jesus who would, who would need to like, traverse the earth, like kind of in a procession. Um, he could do this at any speed, I suppose. Um, maybe because it's accompanied with a sign, there's like some way in which you know that you're seeing Jesus, even though it starts to feel silly if I try to like think of how quickly he would need to move around the earth and how many places he would have to go and how many hours or days that would take. Um, and that starts to feel a little bit, huh? And so maybe 
it's Jesus physically comes in Jerusalem. At the same time as he's coming in Jerusalem, there's a, there's a, there's a supernatural sign around the world that everybody somehow recognizes that's Christ. Like there's just an, oh, an awareness in us. God's revealing to us, this is Christ. He has returned. That might be where I would lean physically coming at Jerusalem, but his sign, the sign of his coming seen everywhere. Some try to say the sign is a cross. The sign is like maybe uh, maybe it's a lamb that was slain. Like we get, look in Revelation, some of the images of Christ. Uh, maybe it's just this massively bright light. I don't know. I don't think scripture tells us what the answer to that is. And I don't think that we should um, go beyond scripture here. Next question. Next debate question. <laughs> what are the clouds? What exactly are the clouds that Jesus is returning on? Now, he's coming in the clouds, on the clouds in some texts. Some people suggest that these are not clouds at all. These are people. The clouds represent people. And um, I haven't talked about this, but Brian Simmons, the author of the Passion Translation, has a particularly wrong view on this topic. And his his view is that G Jesus' second coming, I actually have clips of him I can share with you guys. Maybe maybe I will. I'm not, I don't want to make promises right now. Just thinking about it. But clips of him in many places saying that the second coming of Christ actually is not his visible return it's him manifesting himself in the church because we're the cloud clouds are people and he's manifesting himself in us and so brian simmons has said we are the second coming of christ right we're the and he'll use the term we're the reincarnation of christ it's just one of many reasons why we don't need to listen to brian simmons <laughs> and, and uh promote his material and keep endorsing his works and stuff like that but um but yeah that's the author's passion translation. You can read his own version of Revelation where he gets to embed his weird theology right into the text if you'd like. But but yeah, what's, why do they do this? Well, Hebrews 12.1 is probably the number one verse people would go to to suggest that the clouds Jesus comes in are people, not physical clouds at all. Therefore, since we are, are uh, have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside and, and run for Jesus is the idea. And the cloud of witnesses here are people. This cloud is people. In Hebrews 12, right? Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. Abraham, uh, Rahab, all these people, they had faith. There are a cloud of witnesses in Hebrew 12, Hebrews 12, 1. These aren't witnesses that are watching us. That's how people often interpret this passage. The witnesses are looking at you. They're watching your life. Abraham's watching you. That's not what's happening here. No, no. They're witnessing to us. They're not watching, witnessing us. They're witnessing to us. In other words, their life of faithfulness is an example for us to follow. That's why Hebrews 11 gives, an, gives all the examples of their lives, their decisions, the, them living in faith. So they stand as witnesses to us on how to live in faith. Hence the encouragement, run with endurance. Okay, that's fine. But I would raise you from Hebrews 12, 1, and I would say this is an unrelated passage. I would raise you a related passage, Acts chapter 1, where Jesus goes up into a real cloud and the angel's like, yeah, they're coming back in a real cloud. That's how he's coming back. Also, Daniel 7, 13. We're getting, I admit we're getting a bit into the weeds, but this is what happens with some of the future prophecy stuff. Um, I'd rather you be aware of the weeds than not. Because if nothing else, you might realize that um, there are other people who have different views on these issues and they're, but they're brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if we disagree, we can, we can love one another and be totally united and not, not make it a point of, of uh, division. Anyway, Daniel 7, 13, uh, this is a, a verse that Jesus actually quotes about himself. Even in Mark, he'll quote it about himself, about his coming. It says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Okay, so he's coming with the clouds of heaven. These are not symbolic clouds. They're the clouds of heaven. He's coming with the clouds of heaven. Um, this, in the context of Daniel, in the context of the Old Testament, this is consistently going to be physical clouds, not people. Revelation 14, 14 also helps us out. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Revelation actually talks about groups of people, right? But here it's talking about an actual cloud. It's just a white cloud sitting on a cloud and again, reinforces that in relation to the coming of Jesus, we're talking about uh, clouds, not people. But there's this really cool, I told you there's theological implications of Jesus coming. Well, Psalm 104 verse 3 gives us this neat theological implication of Jesus coming on a cloud. Let me unpack this for you because this is super cool if you get it. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. 
He walks upon the wings of the wind. This is about Yahweh. This is about God. Now, in the context, it is a backhanded slap in the face to the worship of Baal. Because Baal was known as the one who rides the clouds. He is the cloud rider, right? If, if, if he was introducing himself to Smaug, he would introduce himself as cloud rider, right? Barrel rider. Yeah. That, By the way, I, I told that joke last night at the Sunday evening service and nobody laughed. And I know none of you are laughing now. <laughs> I tell it for my own enjoyment. Um, I just really like the barrel rider scene. So he makes the clouds his chariot. Why is this interesting? Because it's where God is backhanding Baal and saying, you don't ride clouds, I do. He's taking back what what the ungodliness of man has attributed to pagan deities. That's what he's doing. He's taking it back. This is what Genesis does as well. In Genesis, we have the creation account where God is given credit for all the things that these people were believing were the conduct of pagan deities or or actually were deities. So they thought the moon was a god, the sun was a god. And Genesis is like, nope, God just spoke it into existence. Oh, Tiamat was cut in half and then this spilled out and became the oceans and the land and the sky. And it's like, nope, nope, there's no deity in, in creation beyond God. God is the one who made it all. So what we have in the history of the universe then, this is beautiful to me. I hope I explain this well. We have God who made all things. Man who then made gods, invented gods to worship instead of God. And then the revelation of scripture comes where God takes back what man has been giving away to other gods. He takes back that glory, that, that, that attribution, the truth about who God is. Then we have Jesus at the second coming. And what is, he, what is happening? He's being given the very things that God took back from all those other false gods. He's, there's, are given to Jesus because now it's Jesus that rides on the clouds. And that's, that's the big reveal moment. It's, it's Jesus who rides on the clouds. Just like in earlier in Mark, it's, uh, in, in Jesus walking on the water, we have references to Job where it's Yahweh. It's God who walks on the water, but he passes us by. We don't reach him. And Jesus, he walks on the water as if he would pass by, but then turns to us. So he's, he's God with us. He's God coming to us. He's God known to us. And it's just beautiful. This is, I don't know if I explained it well, but I hope that your, your mind exploded and that you, you need immediate brain surgery to fix whatever just went wrong. In addition to all that, in the Old Testament, clouds are often uh, symbols or they, they often symbolize God's presence and God's glory. So we see this in the temple where there's like a, a cloud in the temple and they can't, they can't do anything because it's like God's glory comes in a cloud. We see it on, the, on Mount Sinai, the clouds at the presence of God. We see it in the, the tower of uh, smoke by day in the wilderness that was God's presence with them. So since clouds in the temple and clouds in different places represent the presence of God there, Jesus returning in the clouds has another theological layer. And that connotation is he is the center of God's presence. He's bringing the new and true temple with him because it's us united to Christ that are the true temple, are the new temple, are the final temple. And so then he gathers us together with him. He's gathering us together with power, glory, his presence, God on the clouds and us in uh, unity with him. So my conclusion is um, there's literal clouds with heavy symbolic meaning. Jesus returns on clouds, okay, real clouds. But these have deep symbolic meaning that is just wonderful and mind-blowing, just like there's literal darkness and that darkness has heavy symbolic meaning. So I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Um, I'm just kidding. I hope I'm right. I, I'm open to change my opinion on any of these, uh, you know, perspectives about end times things. I'm absolutely open, uh, but I want to build a case for my view and, and be able to say that I feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, even while trying to make you aware of other views. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention here in the gospel of Mark is when Jesus describes his coming, he talks about it as coming with power and great glory. And that, that concept, power and glory, it's to be contrasted with his first coming. His first coming is lowly. He comes on a donkey. He's born in a manger. He comes as a, as a lowly peasant, basically. Um, there's, there's no beauty that we should desire him. There's nothing special except who he is, right? But not his status. He's laid aside his glory. But when Jesus comes for his second coming, he comes to rule and to reign and to judge. He, he came on a donkey to enter Jerusalem in Mark. But in Revelation, we see him on a white horse as the victorious I am a conquer the conquering hero, right? I'm coming into my kingdom. So he's coming with power and glory is the idea. Again, an invisible return, 
doesn't really fit with the idea of him coming in power and glory, right? He's entering his kingdom is the idea. Then we get Mark 10, 45 to help us understand that. For the son of man did not come to serve, but to to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. But that's not at all how he describes his second coming. No, that's power and glory. That is to, to rule and to reign. That is to judge the living and the dead. That's all of those things. And that's a good reminder for us. There's the verse for you. I didn't put it up. It's a good reminder for us. Um, sometimes in our ministry to people, we feel like we have to present Jesus in his lowly, humble meekness, dying on the cross for us. And, and we should, like, we don't stop doing that, please. But we feel like maybe we'll offend people if we also talk to them about him coming as judge and Lord of heaven and earth. And can I tell you, the early church in the book of Acts, they presented both of those realities, right? Peter's like, hey, you killed him. You crucified him. You can repent and be saved. But guess what? He's coming back to judge and you're going to stand before him. And that whole message is the message of, the, of who Jesus is and what he'll do. It includes him as judge. Jesus is Lord. Like whether you like it or not, he is Lord and he will rule and he will take ownership of all things. And if you choose him, you will be in his kingdom and you'll experience his grace and his love and his forgiveness and his kindness and all of the, the meekness of Christ in your place, all of those beautiful things. But if you don't want him as your Lord, then you are in rebellion, right? To the ultimate government of God, which is centered around Jesus Christ. And you're going to be an outsider and you're going to be punished as an outsider. And th this is not a friendly message. This isn't what people want to hear, uh, but it's true. This is like the truth of Christ. This is the truth of the gospel. We will stand before him, the judge of the living and the dead. And what we did with Christ, whether, whether he was our Lord or not, whether we yielded our hearts and our lives to him or not, is the deciding factor for our eternal fate. Everything will change. And I'm uh, looking forward to his beautiful, perfect, wonderful kingdom. All right, back to Mark chapter 13, verse 27. Let's take on the next debated area here. <clears throat> it says here in Mark 13, 27, uh, he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. This is our last verse in Mark we're covering today. Um, and there's two things we want to look at is one, sort of a preterist view of this passage, which I think is wrong. Um, that says these angels are messengers, they're human messengers preaching the gospel. And that the gathering of the elect is just people getting saved and coming to Jesus metaphorically. The other view we're going to look at is how this may support a post-tribulational rapture view. I, again, am not settled on my view of the rapture, but we happen to be in a passage that is probably one of the stronger supports for the post-trib view. I'm going to talk about that in specific detail here. Um, and I know a bunch of people are going to unsubscribe <laughs> when I do. <laughs> so, so be it. I already have more subscribers than I ever thought I'd have anyway. Um, <clears throat> so then he will send forth his angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds. Who are the angels? Are they human messengers or are they like angelic beings, spiritual beings? And if they're human messengers, this is where I think some preterists would go. I imagine Apologia Studios would go this way, that these are human messengers going out. And then this means that, yes, the, the, the coming happened in 70 AD. People didn't really notice it. And the gathering of the elect has been going on for 2000 years because his, his messengers are merely gospel preachers going into the world and people, they don't literally get gathered to Jesus in the clouds, right? Rather, they're spiritually gathered. They come to Christ and they put faith in Jesus. Here's one argument against that view, and it gives us context. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus is also talking about his second coming. And he helps us understand that these are not messengers. Angel, the word does mean messenger, right? But it, it, it could mean humans. It could mean angelic beings. This helps clinch it for us. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Spirit. Angels. So the phrase, the holy angels is not talking about him. When he comes, he sends out earthly humans to be messengers. No, no, he's coming with these angels, with the angels of heaven, the holy angels. So these are not human messengers. The 70 AD view, I think doesn't work at least in the latter part of Mark for sure. And um, that's why even a lot of preterists don't have the view there. They're preterists up until verse like 24. <clears throat> so 
these are real angels. Um, another view, <laughs> another view is that, and this is going to be the pre-trib view. They'll say that the elect that are gathered at this moment refer just to like people in Israel, people who get saved during the tribulation. This is a gathering that isn't even about the rapture, right? But it does, Mark 8, Mark 13, sorry, it does look a lot like the rapture. The description here, we're going to build a case for why this looks like the same event as the rapture. Um, and I'll try to offer some responses from pre-trib, a pre-trib side. And this shouldn't clinch it. This shouldn't be the whole argument for you. The, the pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib discussion is a lot more than just a few verses. It's going to be bigger than that. But we'll talk about a little bit of it here. Here's a post-trib rapture perspective. First, Jesus says when he comes, he's going to send his angels and they're going to gather his elect from all over the world. Well, everybody thinks the second coming is going to happen at the end of the tribulation. So they go, well, if that's when his coming is and the gathering of the elect is then, then guess what? That's when the rapture is also going to happen. You can also connect to this other passages. 2 Thessalonians 2.1. It says, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him. And then he goes on to give some encouragement. But notice this. He connects two things. The coming of Jesus and our gathering together with him. Those two are connected. Well, back in Mark 13, when he comes, he gathers his elect. Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians 2.1. As though these are a part of the same event, our gathering together with him. That's the interesting thing. This is the same passage in Second Thessalonians that the abomination of desolation is. It is in, which means it is connected. That these events are connected to Jesus' prophecies in Mark 13, in my view. First Thessalonians 4 gives us another. And verse 13, another section we should consider. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as those who... Uh, as the rest who have no hope. I see Christians grieve. We just, we have hope even as we grieve. And that's, thank God for that. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, and now he talks about the second coming, God will bring with him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So what's it going to be like when Jesus returns? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And that's where we get our word rapture. It, it's it's who, who, uh, harpazo in the Greek. In the Latin, it's rapturus, and we get the word rapture. But it's, it's this, this is the verse where the word comes from. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So again, we, we have Jesus arriving. We have a gathering of us being with him. It, it's happening in the clouds. This looks like the rapture moment for sure. And it looks like it's connected to the second coming that Jesus discusses here in Mark and in, in, in Matthew and Luke. I think this is pretty strong for a post-tribulational rapture perspective, which I'm, I'm not sure what my view is. I just think this is strong. I, what am I supposed to do? Deny that? I'm not going to deny what seems to be a strong case. Let me add another verse to it. Matthew 24, 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. This is, again, a parallel passage. And, and here we have him sending forth his angels, gathering the elect, from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. This is, it looks like the gathering, those being brought into the air with Jesus. We greet him, we meet him in the air, and then return to him on the air. That seems very sensical with this view. If I had to base my whole rapture view on just the passages I read to you now, I would absolutely be a post-tribulational rapture person. There's a lot of other verses that you should consider. There are pre-tribulational responses. The rapture view, the pre-trib rapture view, is based on more than just the scriptures I brought. And... Some of the ways they would respond if you're like, okay, but how do they how do they react to all this, Mike? They would suggest um, what Jesus is talking about in Mark and what we're reading about in First Thessalonians are perhaps two different things. There is the us being caught up, our hope of being caught up before the tribulation or at the beginning of it, and then there's Jesus coming back. And Mark is talking only about him coming back. Now I have to push back on this and admit this sounds like there's two raptures. So they're going to have 
us all who were alive and remain until the rapture, we get caught up and we're brought up together with the Lord. Seven years we're up and enjoying uh, our, our time with Christ, you know, waiting as the tribulation happens. Then they say a bunch of people get saved. There's a bunch of salvation, especially in, in the Jewish people, 144,000, all that, right? All these people get saved. Then Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation. And those are the elect in Mark 13 that are caught up. We're, we're coming from heaven with Jesus. And there's another rapture, right? They're caught up again. That's what it looks like anyway. Um, that seems pretty weak in my view, if I'm completely honest. And I speak as a guy who's a Calvary Chapel pastor, who um, I don't know if there could be negative consequences for me teaching something different than this. If I was the senior pastor of a church and I was to openly teach that the pre-trib rapture was not the case, which is not my view, but if I was to do that, you know, 20 years ago, you would have to stop calling yourself Calvary Chapel. It's considered a pretty central issue there. Although nowadays, Calvary has shifted and changed in a lot of ways. Some some good ways, some bad ways. It's just a mixed bag like everything else is. And um, I don't know what that would do nowadays. But we have to be bound. And may I say this? If you are if you have an eschatology that's different than the people in your community and your church, that's okay. And you, sh you need to be bound by what you honestly think scripture says. And while my own view is still a little floating, I have to acknowledge this is a pretty strong obstacle for a pre-trib perspective. And I would personally like to hear more discussion on it. I've looked for it. I haven't quite found uh, what I consider to be a solid answer. And I would like to hear more of that. Um, one of these days I might do a project on the topic of the rapture. Maybe it's just truly not the highest on my list. But I do know a lot of people are interested in it. My main point here is that we should not divide over these issues. If there, I mean, I'm willing to change my mind halfway up into the air and be very happy about it. <laughs> Whether that means pre-mid or post-trip or whatever, um, you know, God knows. And um, I don't know everything as I should. I don't know it as well as I should. And prophecy, future prophecy is probably the area where most of us, our confidence outweighs our knowledge in most cases. And, and that can be um, unhealthy. So this then gives us instructions for our lives about the second coming of Christ. Now, I want to I want to really hammer this down before I tell you a couple of real important things about the future here, <laughs> future for my channel, future for videos that are coming. Um, one, our agenda for the coming of Christ is not to watch for it; it is to wait for it. And there's a big difference. If you're watching for the coming, you're obsessing about when it happens, how to predict it, how to predict it. I think that that is a problem. I think that looking for not just the sign Jesus gave, the abomination. But looking for signs that might lead to the signs. What might make a one world government? What might be the, the, the things that lead to the things that lead to the things that are predicted? I think this is an unhealthy obsession that not that nobody can do it well, but I think generally speaking, it's not great. We have made a lot of mistakes as Christians by going too far, going beyond the text of scripture and not just looking for the signs, but looking for the signs of the signs of the signs. And now I, I would say, please, please stop. Your job is this, not to look for the signs of the signs. Your job is to stay faithful to Jesus in your personal life by avoiding sin. Be ready to suffer any kind of hardship or difficulty as you follow and preach the gospel of Christ, no matter what people tell you or what they do to you. You are to be holding off internal temptations of sin and you're to be pushing through persecution to serve Christ. Like this is our obsession. That's what it means to wait on the Lord, not watch in that sense of predicting. That's my encouragement to you guys. Next week, we're going to talk about um, the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree. And is you know people were using this massively um, a generation ago to predict the coming of Christ, that it was going to happen in 1988. And actually, Pastor Chuck Smith even did this. Um, I have I actually found his, his book where he did this. Um, I love Pastor Chuck Smith. He was one of my teachers in the school of ministry at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. And I've listened to seven years of his Sunday night messages because... That's part of what you do in the school. But he did predict, even in this little book here, which you can find on Amazon for like $800. I found a copy for like 12 bucks. So <laughs> I'm happy about that. Where he actually did say that he thought 1988 was the year. And I think that's a very embarrassing moment. It's also all over on Wikipedia. And people who look up Cowrie Chapels, it's one of the first things they find. And I think it's something that we have to confront and deal with. And we're going to talk about that. Next week, the fig tree, what did it really mean? What about those who say it predicts because the you know Israel becomes a nation in 1948, so we have 40 years or 70 years or maybe it's 80 or 120 and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about all that, some missteps that have been made in that regard. 
and I hope that you find it very fruitful. I just want to plug this whole Mark series. This is part 54, verse by verse, doing theology, apologetics, deep into stuff. And I've got the whole playlist down below. You guys can check it out at your leisure if you like. Otherwise, I'll see you on Friday. We're doing a Q&A Friday. Next, next Monday, I'm going to take your questions right from the live chat Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Don't ask me what time that is in your time zone because I don't even know. Um, but I next Monday, don't intend to do a video. This Mark series, I'm still going to meet Sunday night at my church. We're going to do like a discussion time and Q&A and all that. But I'm not going to do a video next Monday on this channel. One little week of just a little bit less work. Uh, for my sake, so I don't go crazy. <laughs> right? That's about it. Uh, let me pray with you all before we head out. Um, Lord, we pray for the humility to know that the words of Christ are absolutely ironclad and true, and that yet our interpretation of some of the things that are in Scripture can be less certain because it's our perspective. We might be missing something. So we know that what you've said is true. We know you're coming back. We know you're returning, and we're waiting on the resurrection, and we're waiting on your coming, and we want to live faithfully, faithfully to you in this world, whatever persecution, disapproval, uh, hate-mongering that we might receive, that we would respond in love and kindness and pray for those who, who, who curse, who bless those who curse us, pray for those who spitefully use us, Lord, that we would give the extra mile to that person, Lord. We pray that you'd help us to have that true attitude of those who know that this world is temporary and that more than anything, what matters is storing up treasures in heaven, which also means bringing other people to heaven with us. We pray, Lord, Sharpen your church. Let end times discussions always yield sanctification in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, y'all. Lord bless you. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for taking time out of your day to go deep in understanding uh, even some complicated things in Scripture. It's not always this complex, but uh, but I'm appreciate that you I appreciate that you take the time and you bear with it because sometimes let me encourage you. Sometimes you you hear these things and you're going, I only stood thirty percent only understood 30% of what Mike said, that's okay. Like if you can have an attitude where you can listen to a study and go, I only got about 30%, that's like a learning attitude. This is an attitude of someone who's gonna keep learning, a lifelong learner. If you feel like the moment you're confused, you have to shut things down and you can't learn anymore, that's gonna really hinder you in a lot of ways. Um, so thanks for sticking with me. All right, that's it, I'm gonna drink coffee.